There are new Brazilian crop estimates in the market this morning, and it's difficult to tell if traders have even seen the estimates or if they've just decided to ignore those crop pegs. And there's more evidence of damage to the Argentine corn crop. We'll do our best to get to the bottom of what is happening. Live from where it's happening via Farm Journal broadcast, this is AgriTalk. This morning, we begin with a chat with Dr. Michael Cordonier from Soybean and Corn Advisor. Then we get Agronomic with Missy Bauer from the B&M Group, uh, from B&M Crop Consulting, excuse me. Directly following the news, Greg Henderson from Drovers. I'm handsome newsman Davis Michelson. And now, here's the host of AgriTalk, Jeff Flory. All right, Davis. Hey, thank you so much. Another beautiful day up here in Northeast Iowa. Yeah. If, if they are not starting to roll and uh, they're they're itching uh-huh. to get ready to oh. roll here it is it's it's april 11th man it's time uh it's time to be putting some seed in the ground i think is what the calendar is saying isn't it is there a cream for that itch what do we do I uh huh? no it's 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 very it, it's a very complicated kind of salve uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, a lot oh, of it is salve. made up yeah a mm-hmm. lot of it is gear grease okay okay yep Yep, mm-hmm. that will take care of a lot of the itch. <laughs> a little gear grease tincture will set you straight, huh? That's, Good to know. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Welcome to AgriTalk. I'm Chip. That's Davis. Yep. Uh, we uh, uh, we're... Something's going on with the Argentine corn crop. Uh, yeah. The, the Argentine Grain Exchange r- really knocked the, uh, just pulled the rug out from underneath its estimate of the Argentine corn crop. Mm-hmm. We will find out from Dr. Michael Cordonier what is going on. Uh, he was on it. He he dropped his crop estimate for Argentina earlier this week, and uh, we'll find out exactly what he is seeing in that Argentine crop. And then Conab. Conab is out with some estimates. We'll find out what Conab is looking at for Brazilian corn and soybean production ahead of USDA's updates coming at 11 o'clock Central Time this morning. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, to Argentina, spiroplasma, spiroplasma. Yeah. I had to take three passes at that when I was doing my morning audio recording. Right. Spiroplasma disease carried by leaf hoppers. Is, right. uh, is that Portuguese for grasshopper, perhaps? Leaf hopper? Is it the same uh, thing? I, I don't know. Okay. Well, don't we got to find out. Know. You know, lots of questions do. for Dr. C. Absolutely. We'll find out from him here in just a bit. All right. Let's get to the news, dude. I'm going to start with the weather. Powerful storm system to foster high wind potential over much of the eastern United States today with severe weather, heavy rain, and flash flood threats for parts of the southeast, upper Ohio Valley, and into the northern mid-Atlantic. There's a high wind threat, everybody, continues across the Great Lakes, northeast, and into the Appalachians on Friday into early Saturday as a flash flood threat will be confined to northern New England. Yeah, we had just some very light showers go through this morning. I'm sure that it's not even going to register on any of the mm. the um, uh, rain gauges out there. But yeah. the activity is is obviously east of the Mississippi River here this morning. Well, Chip, the U.S. dollar spiked overnight, and traders slashed their bets on when or even if the Fed would cut interest rates this year. Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary and critic of the Fed's handling of inflation, told Bloomberg that a rate increase cannot be ruled out. Such uncertainty could last for months and complicate President Biden's bid for a second term. Chip, at the beginning of the year, there was a strong consensus among traders, obviously, that the Fed would cut rates significantly, possibly by as much as 150 basis points. But the situation is now different. The first rate cut now only fully priced for November, Chip. Yeah. 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 If 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 we get a rate cut in November, I don't know if we will or not. Producer prices in the U.S. were up 0.2% month over month in March, the smallest increase in three months following a 0.6% rise in February, and it came in below forecasts for that uh, March producer price index. Yeah, some conflicting info on the consumer price versus the producer price. Mm -hmm. Bovine influenza A virus, or BHAV, was detected in a dairy herd in North Carolina, the state's ag commissioner Steve Troxler said. That marks the 21st case of BF, and North Carolina is the seventh state. Mm -hmm. During its April meeting, the European Central Bank kept interest rates at historically high levels, maintaining the main refinancing operations rate at 4.5%. That marks the fifth consecutive meeting 
without a change in rates. Yeah. Yeah, we need to watch what's going on in the foreign central banks because they might be first with rate cuts. Yeah. Um, And I don't know if that would force the hand of the Fed, but that's one of those outside influences that's stuck in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. European gas futures surged by 5%, approaching their highest level in two months, propelled by concerns over potential attacks on Ukrainian gas storage facilities and escalating geopolitical tensions in the Middle East, and sticking with the energy here, ongoing violence in Gaza amid stalled ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hamas, coupled with U.S. intelligence warnings of potential strikes from Iran, fueled fears of further disruptions to oil supply. Iran, the third largest OPEC producer, faces heightened geopolitical tensions with Israel, raising concerns about oil production and distribution. Meanwhile, Chip, U.S. crude inventories surged by 5.841 million barrels last week, exceeding market expectations and indicating possible oversupply conditions here, buddy. Yeah, uh, that increase in the supply, I think, is what's got the crude oil market under pressure this morning. May crude oil WTI down a dollar three right now. And finally, the National Transportation Safety Board is investigating the electrical system of the Dolly following its collision with the Key Bridge, which resulted in the bridge's collapse in Baltimore. Collaboration with Hyundai, the manufacturer of the engine room equipment on the dolly, is underway to uh, examine that system. Chip. All right. Thank you very much, Davis. Let's bring in Greg Henderson, Editorial Director of Drovers. Hey, Greg, how you doing, man? Good morning, Chip. How are you? Doing real fine. Real fine. King Ranch getting bigger, buying in more uh, uh, feedlot operations. What's going on? Yeah. So King Ranch, that uh, 850,000-acre uh, ranch in South Texas, uh, has bought 50% share in Cobalt Cattle Company, which is the nation's fourth largest cattle feeding operations. Uh, they have six feed yards in Colorado, Kansas, and Texas. That's about 350,000 head. Okay. And I think this is significant, Chip, because it kind of gives us an, an a idea of some of the consolidation that's going on and maybe some of the con- consolidation we're going to see as this feeder cattle supply continues to shrink over the next two years. You know, we've got 24.2 million feeder cattle supply now. That was down 7% from 2022. We haven't started uh, building the herd yet, so that number is going to shrink even more. Chip, I think that's going to put enormous pressure on the small and medium-sized cattle feeders. Um you know, you just mentioned interest rates. Those are a lot higher. A lot of these smaller yards also have the older facilities and, and their capital requirements right now are just enormous. I think this uh, gives us an idea that some of these larger feed yards, some of whom are adding pen space today, uh, are going to have reason to buy out these smaller guys. Maybe some of the smaller guys quit. I just see consolidation uh, expanding as we go through this, um, yeah, you know, yeah. period of time. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, and it's one of the things that is frustrating to a lot, to to many in the cattle industry, is the fact that more and more cattle being raised by fewer and fewer owners, and uh, it it's the growing pains are not insignificant. I mean, the hog guys have been through it, so have the poultry guys, and. This it's not any fun. Not any fun. Greg, good Absolutely. stuff. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Yep, Greg Henderson, editorial director at Drovers. We've got Dr. Michael Cordonier next. The best talkers in ag, including you. Join the conversation on AgriTalk. Call us at 855-4-TALK-AG. Welcome back to AgriTalk. I'm Chip. It's Thursday already. Wow. Thursday yeah. morning. Yeah. yeah. And and off we go. We've got uh, USDA supply and demand reports coming up here in just a little bit. Big Top day. of the hour from USDA. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, feature, the feature of those reports going to be adjustments, if there are any. Well, heck, Davis, if there aren't any adjustments, that's going to be a feature as well. Uh, mm-hmm. to the, the Brazilian corn and soybean crop estimates and the Argentine uh, corn and soybean crop estimates. Dr. Michael Cordonier from Soybean and Corn Advisor has been keeping track 
of the South American crops and potential for many, many years. And he's been the pro farmer crop consultant, uh, and he joins us right now. Michael, it's good to talk with you. How are you? I'm doing fine, Chip. Always glad to talk to you. Yeah, glad you're here, man. Um, so the Rosario Grain Exchange this morning put out that they cut their corn crop, the Argentine corn crop estimate, by 6.5 million ton, Michael, down to 50.5 million metric tons. I 50.5, that's well, below where you're looking for it, isn't it? Yeah, I just cut mine uh, 2 million uh, down to 53. Um, yeah. And they cited... Now that was a that was a cut from their original estimate. Now they cited the problems with corn leaf hoppers, which okay. spread corn stunt disease. Now this is kind of a new thing in Argentina, and I think they're still in a learning process, so to speak, how to control this little insect. And once this insect infects the corn plant, uh, there's no cure, there's no no recuperation from it, and if you look at, say, the province of Cordoba, that's about 28% of the corn acres and production in Argentina. And in that province, it was planted very late. 90% of the corn was planted extra late. And, okay. and the later the corn is, the more incidents you're going to have of these corn leafhoppers and the greater the problem with the disease. So this thing kind of got out of control here pretty quick. And uh, it might actually get worse before it's all said and done. So this is a, a new thing in Argentina. Yeah. So no one expected this, of course, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. What What is it, Michael? Is it just opening up the the interior of the plant to the environment and letting disease in, or is it what's it doing to the crop? It gives it a bacterial disease. Okay. And. It just, and the earlier the plant gets infected, the worse it is. So uh, the early planted corn in Argentina, they're harvesting right now. Yields are actually pretty darn good in Argentina. Uh, but the early yields are going to be the best. The later yields are going to be the worst. And it's all the late planted corn that got planted in December and early January that's going to be infected. So it's a bacterial disease. There's no antidote, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, you got to control the insect. Well, and I've seen reports guys have sprayed four or five times and they can't control it. Okay. Well, I was just going to ask: is 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 it a brand new disease that they have never had to deal with before, or is this a disease that they've had in the past but have controlled? Uh, no. And- this, this is new in Argentina. Okay. Um, there may have been some there last year. But this year is the worst for sure. Brazil had it starting about, I would say, maybe four or five years ago. And it has now spread to all of Brazil. And uh, they are having trouble controlling it as well. So, no, this is a this is a new phenomenon in Argentina. Wow. Okay. So can do you think that corn crop could get down to 51, 50 million metric tons? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh. Uh, yes, because about 40% of the corn was planted in the early phase, and about 60% was planted in the late phase. Now, this insect migrates from early planting, from er- more mature corn to less mature corn. And in fact, in Brazil, for example, places like Paraná, where they plant two corn crops, an early one and a late one, you know, they told the farmers... You know, if you're going to plant a sophenia corn, plant it as, as in the smallest window possible. So the insect doesn't have more corn to keep going to as you plant it later and later and later. Well, that's the current scenario in Argentina. You know, 40% was planted in, uh, in September, October. Then they stopped planting in November, like usual. Then they started planting in December and January. So now you got 60% of the crop is sort of vulnerable to the insect. So... Yes, it, 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 we could get down lower and lower. You know, and I said a long time ago that I thought corn could be the big surprise in, our, in South America this year because of less safina production, but I had not anticipated uh, this yeah. corn leaf hopper problem in Argentina. Okay. All right. Well, CONOB numbers were out this morning, too. Uh, 
Conob put the Brazilian corn crop 110.964 million metric tons down from its previous estimate of 112.753. Um, what are you thinking on the Brazilian corn crop? Yeah, they're down to basically 111. Uh, yeah. I'm at 112. And okay. the big problem, the big change was, of course, the Safinia. So they increased the Safinia acreage at 26,000, but they lowered the yield, almost two bushels per acre. So now the Safinia production uh, is down 1.7 million from last month. And, uh, you know, the big dilemma is in, in Brazil, the acreage. Now, USDA, we'll see what they say here in an hour or so, yep. but uh, they are about 10 million tons more than uh, than Conab for Brazil corn. I don't know which one's correct. We'll see what USDA does here in a little bit. Yeah. But uh, what, the acreage, well, go ahead. I was going to ask, where do you think all of this is on USDA's detection meter? You know, because it, it, it this is the, the private forecasters, you, and others have been out in front leading the the Brazilian crop estimates to the downside. USDA seems to have been very, or seems to be very stubborn where it's at. And I think a lot of that has to do because USDA just sees more area planted to the, yes. uh, to, to corn and soybeans, right? Yes. They say that there's more acreage in the northeastern part of Brazil uh, where, you know, it is kind of a frontier area. So they say that their satellites are picking up more uh, corn and more soybeans up there. But, uh, you know, people on the ground say not so much. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to know who to believe, quite frankly. Okay. Okay. So it, the these pro- let's start with Argentina. Is USDA going to pick up this problem with the corn crop? My guess is no. Uh, and here's why I think that way. The first yields coming out of Argentina are really good. So yeah. the corn is looking really good, but that's only like 40% of the total. And this recent disease with the corn, uh, this came in, it's getting worse and worse. It started a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. and I don't think they're going to pick that up right now. So I, uh, they might trim it a little bit for Argentine corn, but uh, they're not going to be down to you know, 50, 51, 52 million tons. Yeah. Uh, they're going to be much higher than that. Michael, I don't remember a time when the industry estimates have been this far from USDA's thoughts and the spread has been as wide as it is. It, uh, uh, is this something that correct. we're going to have to get used you're, to? I don't know. But I think this is an oddball year for sure, especially in Brazil, where they had, you know, Record high temperatures, record low rainfall, October, November. Uh, a lot of the soybeans had to be replanted. Some were abandoned. Some switched over to other crops like cotton and grain sorghum and that sort of thing. So that was very, very odd for Brazil. And now we got this disease situation in Argentina, which is very odd as well. Yeah. So it just has not been a normal year in South America. And let me throw another one into the works. I just saw a report that there's a 62% chance that we'll be back into a La Nina by mm-hmm. fall, which is mm-hmm. spring in South America. The last time we had a La Nina, it was drought all over the place in yeah. South America. So we may yeah. go into a, a, another year in South America, which is very um, hard to predict, you know, acreage and yields and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But you're correct. This is the biggest spread I've ever seen in South yeah. America. Yep. So still a lot of questions to be answered on this one. Michael, thanks for uh, giving us an update on the situation, especially with what's happening in Argentina. Keep me up on, uh, up to date on that, and and uh, we'll uh, get you back on for an update later. Sure, no problem. Always my pleasure. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. That is Dr. Michael Cordonier, uh, Pro Farmer Crop Consultant, Soybean and Corn Advisor. Okay, CONAB, as I said, 111 at – is is what they're looking for on the Brazilian corn crop. Conob is also looking for the bean crop estimate to come in at one or put the Brazilian bean crop at 146.5 million metric tons, down from 146.8 in its last estimate. 
All right, we're going to talk Eastern Corn Belt production. That's next. Welcome to another installment of the Zoe Checkoff Check-In. And checking in this week is Keenan McRoberts, Vice President, Strategic Alignment at the United Soybean Board. Keenan, Vice President of Strategic Alignment, what does that mean day to day? Basically, I, I lead our investment strategy team, which means across all our areas of investment for feed, food, fuel, industrial uses, and export promotion. I help inform how the board invests against our strategic plan to lead to the highest possible return on investment. Good stuff. Let's talk about soy's benefits in animal nutrition. Tell me about the advantages of soybean meal in animal diets. So as a reminder, the soybean consists of about 80% meal and 20% oil. That 80% meal almost entirely feeds animals. Now, the breakdown for domestic use, we've got close to 60% feeding poultry. That's mostly chickens, but also some turkeys. We've got just under 20% feeding pigs. Then we've got about close to 20% broken between dairy and beef. And then the balance goes into industrial uses and aquaculture. So that meal is almost entirely about 97% feeding our number one customer, which is animal agriculture. We manage an animal nutrition working group. That group consists of some of the leading nutritionists at major companies that you'd all be familiar with, like Tyson, the Mashops, Calmain, ADM Animal Nutrition, and others. So we work with these nutritionists that account for approximately 50% of formulated soybean meal in feed rations across all species. They really advise us on how best to advance the research and the marketing agenda that serves and generates solutions for animal agriculture. Gotcha. So nutritionally, it fits, and financially, it's a multi-billion dollar piece of business for U.S. soybean producers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In one of the most recent market years, we were approaching $16 in soybean meal value, so it's huge. So the amino acids and the energy that soybean meal contributes are the historic value drivers on the nutritional side. Yep. And we're moving toward health outcomes and toward resiliency. And by resiliency, I mean, how do animals perform under health challenges, things like respiratory disease, things like heat stress? And what we're seeing is that there are performance benefits where you've got more meal in the ration relative to alternative feed ingredients. And we've got a lot of evidence supporting that now, especially on the swine side. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit specifically about swine nutrition. There is some promising new research. Uh, that highlights the added value of soybean meal in a swine ration in hog health. Tell us about that. Yeah, this is really a beautiful thing. There are some of these additional health benefits. They're likely driven by bioactive or functional compounds in soybean meal that allow animals to perform better and more efficiently partition energy toward productive outcomes like growth rather than fighting off disease or getting over periods of stress and partition that into growth and productivity more efficiently. And we're really advancing a marketing track based on a number of both academic and commercial studies partnering with a number of the companies that we work with as well. Right. Okay. Talk to me briefly about the role that soybeans play in not just feeding a growing population of animals around the world, but just a growing global population. So in much of the developing world, the population is growing very fast, combined with a growing middle class, and with that, a desire to start to consume higher quality protein. And that protein typically tends toward animal protein. These countries tend to be deficient in in protein supply and in feed ingredient supply to feed those animals. So this is where the collaboration with our export partners like the U.S. Soybean Export Council, the U.S. Meat Export Federation, and the U.S. Poultry and Egg Export Council comes in. Because basically it helps bridge that gap between the growing demand for protein to meet food security needs in developing countries and what's available locally. A lot of that's achieved through trade. As a reminder, U.S. soy exports approximately 60% of its products. And most of that's in the form of whole soybeans, but also a large chunk of soybean meal and a little bit of oil as well. So that's a really important demand channel for U.S. soy here domestically, and it plays a critical role in filling that protein gap and sustainably feeding the world. 
as the population grows and as economies grow. So we're excited about that. That's a really a key contributor to global growth that U.S. soy can play a key role in. Yeah, it's fantastic, Keenan. And, you know, it's been great checking in with you on the checkoff check-in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chip. Really appreciate the opportunity. All right. That is Keenan McRoberts, Vice President, Strategic Alignment at the United Soybean Board. To learn more about the soybean checkoff, go to unitedsoybean.org. This has been the Soy Checkoff Check-In. Now, let's get back to AgriTalk. Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. The truth is hard to come by these days, unless you listen to AgriTalk. Welcome back to AgriTalk. I'm Chip. Glad you're with us. We're going to talk about what's going on over in the eastern Corn Belt right now with crop consultant Missy Bauer, B&M Crop Consulting. Missy, it's great to talk with you. How are you? Oh, well, we're doing good. We're doing good. good. Probably got more rain last night than we need, but uh, we're all right. All right. How are things there around Coldwater, Michigan? Um, you know, we're we're not too bad. Uh, some beans uh, went in the ground the last couple of days. Um, I would say uh, mainly Tuesday and yesterday. So um, some of the early beans. Um, so conditions had been pretty decent right along. We've kind of been on the edge of that drought map, but you know, last few weeks we've gotten a lot more rain. Um, but overall conditions are still pretty good. We don't probably need all we're going to get out of this system, but uh, yeah. we're, we're set up pretty good. A lot of field work got done in March uh, or f- first half of March there when it was so nice in February and stuff. So it's a different start. A lot of times we're getting in the fields and we're so far behind with the fertilizer and the lime and, uh, yeah. you know, all the other tillage things that we need to do. So a lot of that's actually done for once. So that I think is a good thing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you're you're based there cold water michigan but a lot of your your work is done in indiana ohio and michigan is that right yeah that that's correct and you know as you get down into indiana yep. and in ohio it's definitely been a lot wetter down there for sure um so less things have been getting done you know it's coming out of a very interesting winter right we're very mild winter uh, across the board um, so it's a little different than what we're used to. I think farmers kind of forget what some of the issues that come along with that. I mean, definitely we could have more issues with insects or whatever that you think about. But the weeds is probably our biggest problem that, you know, if we don't get in and get some of these burn downs done and guys try to cheat as much as they can and not having to do some of those and try to just kind of plant and then spray. But boy, some of these fields are getting really dirty and you know, for, for some of us, for corn, we got a while to go probably before we're going to plant too much corn. And, uh, yeah, the the weed issue I'm very, very concerned about. Well, and they've got the, – the forecast calls for some activity in your weather pattern over the, the next week or 10 days with some, with some rains, right? Yeah, there's more rain in the forecast and, um, you know, warm temps. So I think that's mm-hmm. the difference. You know, a lot of times we've had where you get a little wet in the spring, but it's the warm temperatures that we had early on and continue to get these spurts of warm, you know, and that's what really gets the weed pressure going and, and kind of gets it out of hand. Once you get that little bit of moisture, that's all it needed at that point. Yep. Yep. So you guys had a great year last year with, with corn and Corn yields in particular, soybean yields were also pretty doggone good over there. Uh, how does that change what you need to do to prep for the crop this year? You know, I, I think for we did come up some huge corn yields, and we come up a fall where there was nothing done in the fall um, because we were such late harvest over here. Um, so it, it, it did mean, you know, a lot of tillage work needed to get done. Um, was probably the main thing because we come out of a fall with none getting done. Um, but, but that being said, February was so nice and the first half of March was so nice. A lot of that work that we normally do in the fall got done during that time frame. So, so I don't know that the big yields affect too much other than, you know, your normal plans and preparation. You got more residue maybe to deal with, but we're kind of used to that at this point. So, yeah. um, I think it's just, you know, try to, you know, lay out your plan and, and follow that agronomic plan of what we want to do. 
you know, obviously with the prices, you know, sinking like they had there, you know, a lot of guys are trying to figure out what can I cut or what can I pinch. But Mm -hmm. when it comes to, to these types of margin years, you know, bushels are what make it win. So you gotta be real cautious cutting too much. So we've had a lot of meetings with growers of, you know, sticking the course. And I would say that, you know, majority of guys understand that and are willing to to do that. Now, maybe it's the little things maybe they don't need to do. Well, do I want to try this new product? Well, maybe I don't need to try that this year. Maybe I'll wait till next year to try something new or, you know, when there's a little bit more fluff in, fluff in the margins. So. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. So this time of the year, what do you find yourself reminding growers over there that they need to do consistently to, to, to grow that extra bushel per acre or something like that? Right. So right now, I think, you know, as you know, maybe a lot of guys haven't really turned too much over by us as far as in the planters, but these, you know, this next week or so, as you wrap things up, you know, that, that planter prep is just huge and making sure your corn and bean planter both, you've got basically went through your 10 point planter checklist and you've got all that taken care of. And then as we head out to the field, I think the biggest thing that we've learned over the last several years is the amount of patience we need to have for planting corn is huge. So if you get antsy and you want to do something, we've been very successful planting beans early. I mean, yes, it still needs to be fit. We're not going to go mud beans in, but planting beans early, whatever we lose in the lack of uniformity and things not coming up maybe as well, what we're gaining from just the pure planting date trumps that. So in beans, it's been huge to be ready to get out there and get beans in during the little windows that we get so we can have less late planted beans on our farm. Corn, on the other hand, I think what we've learned in the last couple of years coming off for us, two record years in a row with very little corn planted before the 10th or 15th of May, is that patience pays off because the uniformity of emergence is king in corn. So if I plant the corn and it can come up in seven days and never look back and just keep going, that's where we set off the front side of it to have good yields. Now, yeah, we got to have help with Mother Nature on the back end, but getting that uniformity in corn is so huge. So and that's hard for growers, you know, also, especially if the neighbors get going or maybe it's fit <laughs> as far as dryness, but it's still cold. Um, we've got to have those steady heat units and look at your forecast, do heat unit forecast. If I plant my corn today, how many days will it take to get it out of the ground? I mean, it's just math. Anybody can do it. Yeah. Look, pick your favorite weather, you know, site that you use and look at what the forecasts are and run the calculations. But as we've done that, I think it's really helped you know, the foundation of the corn yields for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's no question about it. If, if there is one thing and, and we notice it when we're out on crop tour and in the third week of August, every year, Missy, you can tell the fields very easily that emerged with consistency uh, from, from North to South, East to West across that field. And, and they've got better yield potential than if you've got the, the ragged stand or, or ear sets on those stocks. Um, it, it's, it's true. What you're, what you're talking about is absolutely 100% accurate that that consistency and that emergence is, is going to set the groundwork for a good yield later, later in the year. So yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. And patience. That's right. I mean, with- Patience. And that's what I think we, you know, and coming off two big corn yields and knowing that most, you know, used to be, you think, well, if you didn't start planting corn on the 15th of May, well, then that's late. Well, no, that's basically probably depending on the weather, obviously, in your heat units. But for us up here, you know, if I can plant it, it can be out of the ground in seven days. I'm going to have a lot better opportunity. Now, you know, you still got to get it all done too, right? We don't want to get yep. too into June, obviously, either. So you still got to manage the logistics on your farm. Um, but the the patience on corn, I think, has been huge. And, yeah. and, you know, this year we have been seeing, you know, some seed. We do a lot of seed testing for quality. There's been some shaky seed on the corn and bean sides both. Um, and and even, even dealers getting numbers pulled back from them and stuff. So there's some seed quality issues probably out there too, which – Okay. Again, means patience is more important, okay? So, you know, the warm germ's fine, so let's make sure it's in the conditions that, you know, we can plant it and it get out of the ground good. Yep, yep, okay. Something that you said early 
Missy, I want to go back to, and that's the bugs. Uh, Joe and Davis and I have talked uh, more than a few times during the winter that we wonder what exactly it might do to bug populations for us this spring. Is there anything that you want to do special this spring to make sure that you're not going to get behind on, on insect control? Well, you know, one of the things to think about, and this kind of goes back to what I mentioned on the weed thing, but there's just so many green fields, right, from the winter annuals just having such a warm, warm December and then, you know, part of January and then a lot of February warm. As those winter annuals get that early start like they have this year, even as insects that don't overwinter here, so um, black cutworm, you know, moths flying up and, and things, they're going to target those types of fields to lay their eggs in. Anything that's green, they're going to go in. So then all of a sudden we start looking at, well, now we could have more potential issues in some of these fields because they were basically yeah. dirty at the time of these peak flights are occurring. So, you know, yeah. one yeah. thing I think is really important and it all goes hand in hand is the idea of these getting some of these burn down applications done. Um, and like I said, farmers like to kind of chintz or cheat when it comes to that sometimes, just trying to make it all work in a one-pass thing. But this is probably not going to be the year to do that. If you got an opportunity to get out there and get things killed off, uh, so when you get out there with the planter, things are clean. That's what we need to focus on because it won't only affect your ability for that planter to run through there uniformly, uh, but then also, you know, more potential issues with insects as well. Yep, yep. Well, Missy, this we know for certain. Every growing season is different. We're going to learn something from 2024 that that we haven't maybe even thought about in the past on what it takes to grow corn and soybeans. So keep your eyes open for that one, okay? You know, we try. We try. We're <laughs> learning every year and every day as we go as well. So yeah. uh, just good reminder out there to uh, farmers, just take a step back, go a little slower, be safe. So most accidents happen when we go too fast. Amen to that. Amen to that. Good stuff, Missy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to talk with you. You bet. Missy Bauer, B&M Crop Consulting out of Coldwater, Michigan. Okay, uh, we've mentioned it a couple of times this morning already. Going to mention it again right now. We've got a report from USDA coming up. Davis and I will make sure that you know what the trade is expecting next. You suffer from talking on the radio phobia? No problem. Send us a tweet at hashtag AgriTalk. Welcome back to AgriTalk, everybody. Your pal Davis Michelson here with Chip Flory. Bro, I got a problem. Oh. On my. Uh... <laughs> so, you know, as well as anybody, I, uh, I used to shoe horses for a yep. living for a short yep. time there. Seen it with my um, own eyes. Indeed. Indeed. Um, now there are farriers who work with the bovines. Sure. And on on my Facebook feed, I've I've clicked on a few of those videos. You know, that's a yeah. that's a oh, some of these are nasty, bro. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, and it, but it's so rewarding to see that clean, healthy hoof at the end. I don't know. There's something and, about that that just it the, makes the atrocity worth it. And the cow walking <laughs> away. Yes, just walking away. Just yep. walking away to make yep. more milk. Yep, I, I agree. Yeah, it's yep. rewarding. Yeah. Yep, for sure. It just just occurred to me during the break there, I was flipping through my Facebook a little bit. Oh, um, oh that's yeah. it? I thought you were going to tie that into something. No, I don't want to go too far down this road because, you know, it's kind of gnarly. We didn't... Oh, okay. Yeah, no. Okay. No. All right. Yeah. You know, you, you, you get under that false Moving soul on. and you don't know what you're going to find. You know, <laughs> that's, that's the thing. That's right. You don't know what's under there. Um, uh, And quickly here, too, safety first, everybody. Um, Oh, yeah. Missy Bauer brought it up. Accidents happen when we go too fast. You know, slow is smooth. Smooth is fast. You got to slow down to speed up. And I'll just say this one last thing. Don't stick your hand in there. (laughs) Whatever you do, you are not quick enough. I know you think you are. You're not. We want you whole. We want you safe. That's you all. Are That's so all. right. Yeah. You are so right on that. Yep. Um, yeah. It. Uh, don't don't do the risky stuff. It's just not right. worth it. Yep. It's yep. Just Slow down to speed up, everybody. Yep. Um, 
Okay, a good talk with Dr. Michael Cordonier, and I know we want to get to the USDA stuff here real quick ahead of the, the reports, uh, talking about the Argentina uh, bug problem, mm-hmm. uh, which then lays a, somehow creates a, a bacterial infection within the plants, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, the pathology isn't as important as it was when I heard Missy Bauer talking about the potential for insect pressure yeah. in the eastern belt this year. Yeah. That yeah. made me a little nervous because... Those bugs down in South America have hopped from Brazil and made their way into Argentina now, according to Dr. C. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Probably different bugs up here. Yeah. Uh, we got to watch it, man. Oh, definitely. Definitely. New new issues, different issues. Um, sometimes it's an old issue that's new again that needs to be in your crop protection mindset as you're getting into the... Uh, into the growing season. There's no question about it. The mm-hmm. the mild winter that we had, while it was very enjoyable. Sure. Uh, listen, I can live with the 10 days of, of cold that we had. I get it. Uh, but that 10 days may have left us with some consequences to pay for this year, and that might be having to deal with a few more bugs in the corn and soybean crops than what we've had to in the past. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, seed treatments, um, the, uh, the, the, and, and just being very uh, mindful when it comes to making your plans for, for insect control mm-hmm. for this year. I think that's, that's prudent. And a nice hot burn down she's looking forward to this year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get rid of that weed cover. Uh, yeah. the, the fact that it has been as warm as it is, I, I was going to kind of joke around with her and I thought, no, you yeah. know what? It's, it's, it's really not a joke because it's absolutely true, but we've already started to accumulate growing degree days this year. There have mm-hmm. been days that, you know, the, that, that we've seen positive GDDs, mm-hmm. uh, and in the week ahead, those days are going to be coming more. We might be 80 degrees here on, on Sunday, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. Yep. Uh, it, it, That'll do we're it. Go- we are going to start accumulating GDDs very quickly. So watch the weeds and y- you, you can talk to your entomologists about this as well, but mm-hmm. the bugs react to the GDDs and, and grow. Sure. They do it on GDDs, the same as plants do. So yeah, keep they like it as much as we way. do. For yep. Sure. Yep. All right, real quick. USDA expected to make relatively modest changes to its domestic usage forecast in the S&D report coming up here in about five minutes, Chip. Right. The biggest change that I see based off of the average trade guess on a survey done by Reuters is on corn. The average trade guess for 23-24 carryover, 2.102 billion bushels, down 70, 70 million bushels from March. So, that's not an insignificant change. Uh, gets us closer to that 2.0, uh, which gets us closer to a sub 2 billion bushel carryover, which I think would change a lot of attitudes in that market. But for now, it takes 70 million bushels off it. I think that's what the trade is probably looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, USDA in March on soybeans was at 315 million bushels. The average trade guess 317 million bushels up two million bushels and then on wheat the average trade guess 690 million bushels up from 673 million bushels in march and then on cotton carryover which has been absolutely all over the place dude Mm -hmm. uh is expected at 2.56 million bales in march it was 2.8 million bales 2.8 2.8 million bales is a small number for mm-hmm. cotton carryover. 2.56 would be is obviously even smaller, but there you go. I mean, it, it's something that we need to watch. And yeah. um, then, then just real quickly on the the South American crop estimates on corn, the average trade guess on Argentine corn 55.6, Brazil corn 121.75. On soybeans, Argentina, 5.5 million metric tons. On Brazil, 151.68 million metric tons. So a lot of numbers to digest. Yes. 
Real quick here, corn, uh, just a, just minutes ahead of the report, um, right around unchanged, soybeans off about eight, and looking down at the wheat complex, down about five to eight cents, we'll call it, ahead of the report here, Chip. Outstanding. Outstanding. All right, come back this afternoon. We're going to have a conversation with Ed Usett from the University of Minnesota. He's a crop marketing specialist there at the Extension Service at the U of M. And tomorrow morning, we're going to have a conversation with Trish Cook, past president of the Iowa Pork Producers. And then we're going to have a free-for-all with Wiesmeyer, Tyne Morgan, me, and Davis right here on Agritalk.